Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Karishma Gokhale Welch, um, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to today's webinar. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm a technical project lead at the US Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL. Welcome to today's webinar, which is a wind technology primer and one of two modules focused on the wind project development process. Uh, we will focus today on providing background on current wind technology and price trends, cutting edge wind technology research and recent successes, as well as provide an introduction to key wind technology concepts. This will then help set the stage for the second webinar in the series on August 12th tomorrow, which will focus, uh, which will provide an overview on the wind development process. The second set of webinars that's next week on August 18th and 19th will focus on renewable energy procurement. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So this series of four webinars is brought to you by the United States Agency for International Development or USAID. Um, I'd like to invite Shayan Shafi, Senior Energy Advisor, USAID Bangladesh, to say a few words. Shayan? Uh, thanks, Karishma. Um, can you hear, um, Karishma, can you hear me? I'm sure yes. it's the same for everyone. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening and assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, this is Shayan Shafi. I lead the energy portfolio in USA in Bangladesh. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar series on green project development and green, uh, renewable energy procurement. I would uh, formally like to welcome you to this four-part webinar series on behalf of USA in Bangladesh. As you know, reliable and affordable access to energy is critical to sustain economic growth in Bangladesh. Uh, meeting the ambitious target to uh, achieve middle income nation status will become increasingly challenging as uh, we all know the domestic resources such as natural gas in Bangladesh are projected to decline. While at the same time, a growing economy and population continues to demand more energy resources. Uh, on top of that, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Bangladesh might enter into a prolonged period of significant overcapacity, uh, leading to the need for increased, increasing subsidies, power tariffs, and capacity payments for ideal power generation plants. This complex situation has also opened up an opportunity, the opportunity for policymakers to re revisit the nation's power development policy and move towards domestic renewable energy which can also reduce overall system costs while enhancing uh, energy security and resilience for a country. Over the past several years, uh, USA Bangladesh, we have been working in collaboration with the government of Bangladesh, the private sector and academic institutions and have increased adoption of renewable energy technologies and energy efficiency measures. We also strengthen the regulatory climate of the energy sector and promoted regional energy security in the South Asia region overall. Our interventions to promote clean energy development in Bangladesh were primarily through technical assistance, policy support, institutional capacity building, and incentive programs. Standing today, we continue to commit ourselves to advance clean energy development in Bangladesh. In light of that, today's webinar which uh, you, you can refer to the current slide being displayed, uh, will talk about uh, wind energy development, project development, and renewable energy procurement. So these two themes are, are implemented by two of USAID's uh, programs. Uh, the wind power capacity building activity is implemented by the US Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, and uh, this project actually focuses on creating a competitive wind power market in Bangladesh by enhancing private sector interest and investment. The other project, which will uh, talk more about renewable energy procurement in this uh, four-part webinar series, is called the Scaling Up Renewable Energy or SURE Bangladesh project, which is implemented by Tetra Tech. This project focuses on integrated resource planning variable renewable energy integration, energy storage, and renewable energy procurement and auctions. 
Uh, I would like to stop here and I would uh, leave with a message that uh, if you have any questions throughout the uh, webinar or USAID activities in the energy sector in general, uh, please reach out to me, to USAID, and we will be happy to accommodate the request that you have. And as always, we will be uh, eager and happy to collaborate with you along the process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheyenne. Um, and we will share contact details at the end of this um, presentation, so you'll have those. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today. My colleagues, Mark Jacobson, who's senior project leader at NREL, and Barbara O'Neill, who's grid integration manager at NREL. Uh, Mark's diverse career includes energy efficiency program development, interconnection queue management, natural gas fired electric generation development and utility scale wind energy development. Uh, he's been at NREL about seven years now, uh, where his work focuses primarily on providing international and domestic technical assistance on renewable energy technologies and resilience planning. Barbara leads projects and engages stakeholders to provide information on renewable energy integration practices, policies, regulations, and technologies around the world. Previous to NREL, she developed utility scale wind and solar projects, as well as negotiated hundreds of megawatts of renewable energy power purchase agreements. Um, and you know, you might have met some of us um, when we were last in Dhaka, so uh, it's a pleasure to be together again. Um, today, we'll, you know, Mark and Barbara will present for about 45, 50 minutes, after which we'll save time to address questions uh, and for further discussion. So please make sure you stay muted during the presentation uh, but if you have questions during the webinar, we welcome you to type them in the chat box, uh, which you can find uh, at the bottom panel of your screen um, and at any time during the webinar. Um, so there's, you know, we will interact with you because we're far away. We will interact with you through a series of poll questions today that will pop up during the webinar. So there's a link in the chat box. Um, please click on that Poll Everywhere link. That will take you to a browser, uh, to your browser, where you can answer the question and then come back to the Zoom meeting to see how others, how you and others have responded. So some of you might have already used this application. We're all doing a lot of webinars these days, but let's quickly just test this with a question. Um, so if you look in your chat, there, there should be a link. Um, if you click on that link, it'll take you to a browser. I'll give everyone a minute here. It'll load. And the question, this is a little fun question to start the webinar with, but what is your favorite dish? Uh, I think food, food is popular amongst all cultures. So um, if you've made it to that point, go ahead and respond. And then if you come back to the to the Zoom, you should be seeing these answers populate. So it looks like biryani is the clear winner so far with 73% of the votes. We'll give everyone a minute here to get used to this. Maybe a few more. Any more responses? No one has a sweet tooth here, looks like. No one is voting for the Roshogola. <laughs> hey, is my answer, Karishma. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Well, maybe another 15 seconds for folks to get familiar with this uh, polling mechanism. And then um, with that, Mark, I will hand over to you. So maybe just another five seconds, you can get started. Okay. Thank you. Oh, there we go, sweet tooth. Well, thank you, Krishma, for the intro. Uh, we really appreciate government of Bangladesh and numerous other stakeholders who have supported our work over the last six to seven years uh, as we've provided new data products, tools, and capacity building 
collectively used to support a new renewable energy future uh, in Bangladesh. Additionally, I'd like to give a shout out uh, to the SURE team who's been a great uh, set of collaborators with us on these four uh, renewable energy learning modules uh, that are about to be launched. Uh, we were we peer reviewed each other's presentations and I think uh, it made it made for a better end product. Um, the, I think we skipped a slide here. Maybe go back one slide to the outline. Yes. Um, uh, so why is this module important? You know, what is the BLUF? I don't know if you're familiar with, with that acronym, B-L-U-F, bottom line up front. Uh, these technology improvements, um, which along with complementary policy, is increasing deployment rates around the world, uh, enabling the benefits of economies of scale and resulting in significant cost Increases, which lead to significant price decreases for the end user. Setting these mature markets in North America, which is where we're going to start, and then move to um, markets around the world and see how these trends have, have continued or not, um, I think <clears throat> provides us hints um, at uh, lessons learned and gives us some good takeaways uh, as to what is possible in a country that is just starting there their um, um, renewable energy industry. Um, going over the agenda really quick, the, the goal here is to talk through a number of technology trends, uh, show how that research has led towards the, these technology improvements and how that's led to performance improvements and consequently to price decrease, decreases. And then we'll go through a summary and answer questions. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Just one moment, please. Yeah, I was thinking about that, and um, my, I'm not sure if I have to Someone doesn't have their mute on. Um, uh, so I don't want this to be an advertisement of NREL, but more of an example of what research facilities are looking at uh, across the, the world. Um, I think our, the NREL, research facility that I'm gonna talk about right now is, is the lead in North America, but there are other such facilities in, in um, other parts of the world and collectively their um, results have, have led to these um, price increases that we're gonna talk about. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of storytelling today as we show how we've got, where we started and, and where we're going. So, the kind of research that's going on right now um, here at NREL is, is looking at individual components, uh, blades, uh, towers, um, stresses on the, on the system, uh, microgrids, um, uh, uh, reliability, and, um, and then research modeling. How can we simulate uh, different situations and learn from them? Next slide, please. So the, I think what is important with all uh, research is that you're not uh, in a cocoon. You're working with, with uh, industry, and that's certainly the case uh, at NREL, where we have a, a um, advisory, industry advisory team that we constantly meet with. Every, every quarter, um, I think there's an, an online meeting and once or twice a year an in-person meeting, and, and they help define our goals. So certainly the goals are improving energy production, uh, reducing the cost of installation, improving reliability, and then some soft engine that maybe some people don't think about. How do you eliminate barriers to, to large wind development uh, on the permitting side? Certainly there are individuals, communities that as you get closer and closer, you have um, uh, urban, you know, what we call urban creep, where uh, communities are getting larger and larger and getting closer to uh, industrial areas or, a, or an agricultural area, I should say. Um, sometimes it becomes more difficult to permit these large projects that typically um, uh, are sited in agricultural areas. So learning how to um, make uh, decisions, provide feedback, or not, excuse me, not feedback, but uh, tools that um, uh, help work with and 
with uh, uh, communities is a, is a key part of, of some of our research. Next slide, please. So this is our, our site in, in Colorado. Um, and it was strategically sited. You see that notch in the mountains um, where you can see the snow-capped mountains uh, beyond. We call that El Dorado Pass. And we located this um, test facility, this test uh, um, uh, facility in um, this area that's right in front of the notch. We'll get winds that are 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, sometimes over 100 miles an hour, but we'll shoot through that pass and really put the turbines through their paces. We work with industry, and I think that's an important takeaway from this. We work with industry to make sure that, that we're um, structuring our, our research process in a way that helps them improve reliability and, and handle these, these strong winds. Uh, more than half of the turbines that you see out here are still owned by um, industry and we work with them collaboratively on, on various projects. We also have two dynamometers. One's a, um, quite a bit older now. I think it's from the, the 90s, a two and a half megawatt dynamometer that tests the, the gearbox and the drivetrain. Uh, we just uh, some, somewhat recently in the last seven years, I think 2003 is when we commissioned the five megawatt dyno and that's looking at um, testing the gearbox and drivetrain of larger, um, larger uh, uh, turbines. We also have a, a um, solar array. We've added two more since this picture was taken. So I think we have a total of about two megawatts of solar. We've got, I'll talk a little bit more about a um, controllable grid interface that uh, sets up a, a specific microgrid in the area where we can test remote systems. And um, we've also added some battery banks um, so we can look at storage coupled with um, variable generation and see how we can marry those two together to solve some of the, the um, uh, problems out there in our, in our uh, weaker um, uh, grid scenarios. Next slide. Oh, I should, should also mention that this is a 305 acre uh, facility that um, uh, encompasses about 11 or 12 megawatts. So that's the total amount of generation that we, we have here. We also increased our interconnection with the local utility so we can go up to 20 megawatts. So there's a lot of future research that we're, we're looking to conduct here at the, uh, at the wind site here at NREL. Next slide. So this is the uh, new five megawatt dyno that I, I referenced. Um, the uh, the kind of muted green blue box in the very back is an 8,000 horsepower motor that helps turn um, the, uh, the dyno. And we'll hook up a, a nacelle on the front end, which is not there. We don't have a, a test article uh, shown in this picture. This is just the dynamometer itself. Um, but it actually can take that rotor and move it an inch or inch and a half in any direction to add that stress on the entire gearbox. And, and we can um, uh, simulate uh, a 20 year life of a gearbox um, in just a, a few months with uh, some of the, the test um, stresses that we can, we can induce in some of the projects that we've, we've um, moved forward on. I might mention that, that um, the earlier <clears throat> dynamometer, the two and a half megawatt dynamometer is a perfect example of some of the collaboration that we have with industry. Back in the eighties and nineties, this was probably the main critique of wind energy was gearbox, early gearbox and drivetrains failing. Um, I know as a former wind developer myself, I'd put together a, a um, um, pro forma and we were always told and um, instructed that the, we should assume um, a major maintenance component in that pro forma uh, in year eight or nine for the gearbox. But we were in, encountering in real life, in real life, um, gearbox failures in year three and four. And it wasn't just with one brand, it was with all the brands. And so we pulled together eight, um, I believe, manufacturers um, who had similar problems that were open to sharing some of their data and developed some research projects that would, would help. We had committees, again, developed uh, 
um, in conjunction with, with all eight of these manufacturers. And we tested gearboxes, different types, um, over, over several years and really learned about uh, how to improve materials uh, in, in uh, manufacturing the actual gears themselves, uh, how to improve the controls. Um, and, and one of the, the major developments was taking a, a turbines that had a, a 80 to, to 100 RPM uh, rotation and moving normal operations down to 25, changing that entire gearbox so that you had a 25 RPM um, uh, um, normal operation. And with that collective um, set of, of uh, research projects, uh, we moved these failures that were happening in year four. Now the average uh, failure has been moved to, to uh, year 12. So uh, a significant increase in the reliability of the drivetrain and the gearbox. And a lot of them started from the, the dynos that um, were here at NREL. And again, there was some other research in other parts of the world too, and we, we shared in those results. Next slide. So this isn't a real, it's a little bit busy, but this isn't a real um, uh, interesting slide because the, the actual testing equipment is not um, uh, very complicated and interesting to look at, but the results I think are. So this gray box in the photo on the top right is um, our CGI that we've had up and running, I think for um, uh, over five years. It's a controllable grid interface. And I think this might be interesting for those that are familiar with the grid in, in Bangladesh and in other uh, countries around the world. Certainly we've got this issue in the United States too. As you have radial systems, radial transmission systems, you get, you get weak grids and that can, that can uh, take its toll on equipment that's connected to those grids. So we've created our own microgrid at the wind site and um, this box has a bunch of ABB equipment in it, and we can induce our own faults um, um, in this small microgrid. And the microgrid, what's connected to that microgrid is, I think, both dynamometers. One of our um, turbines, I believe the 1.5 megawatt GE turbine is connected to that grid. We've got uh, two battery banks. Uh, I think the solar facility is simulated, uh, has a simulated connection to that grid. So we've got generation, uh, storage, and, and we're able to kind of um, throw a bunch of, of uh, faults and, and um, other negative issues that might exist on a, on a weak grid uh, at that equipment and try to, you know, solve the problem, right? So if there's any equipment that fails, you know, why did it fail? How can we improve upon it? And uh, this microgrid, this controllable grid interface, um, uh, has been a, um, uh, it's, it's one of the few in the world, I think, that um, is able to, to look at these problems in, in real time. So we're not just doing analysis on the computer, we've got actual equipment and components that we can um, insert into this microgrid and into this, um, at this entire um, wind facility and, um, and work with other countries and other industry to, um, to test their um, their problems in their country. Next slide. So this is uh, some of the blade testing that we have going on at the wind site. And uh, what's interesting, I think, is uh, a little story I like to tell is that uh, industry isn't always correct at uh, forecasting the future. So back in, in um, you know, 20 years ago when we were designing this this uh, blade testing facility that's on the on the that's in the top picture. We went to our industry advisory panel and presented our our design for the test facility itself. I talked about some of the research that we could do, and um, it only was uh, designed for I think a thirty meter blade, and uh, we had one industry representative, not not the entire group, but one that said, "Oh, blades are never going to get." Um, beyond 25 meters, who you're spending, you're wasting the taxpayers' money and spending too much money to to uh, build a bigger facility than than what's needed. 
Well, by the time we got the funding and finished the design of the building, um, we found out that the blade size had already moved past 35 meters and we had to cut a hole in the wall and uh, stick the blade out, as you can see there, uh, to complete our research projects. Soon this facility became too small, even with the hole in the wall, and we worked with a consortium uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and that's the picture in the, in the lower uh, part of this um, uh, slide. And now, moved to the next slide, please. You can look inside that building. This is an inside photo of that building. Now we're, we're testing um, stresses and, and fatigue tests uh, and failure tests on 90 meter blades in, in that facility. So uh, the blades are getting longer and so are the test facilities. Next slide, please. So um, so as we pivot towards some of the reliability um, testing, um, we've, we've noticed that in, in real life, um, um, you know, the, the wind speeds are not the same across the, the swept area of the rotor. And so it's important to really understand that. And so we have um, 134 meter, in fact, I think it's actually 140 meter um, Met tower that we have placed in front of some of the key turbines that we're performing tests on. I think this turbine is the Siemens turbine, a two megawatt uh, Siemens turbine. And of course, I think most of us know that that wind speeds lower to the ground are slower and wind speeds that are higher in the air are, are stronger. Well, think about how that induces stress on the rotor itself. So you, you got you know, a stronger force uh, at the top of the rotor uh, diameter uh, where the wind speeds are stronger and you have a lower force at, at the bottom and that's creating torque uh, on, the, on the turbine itself. And, and, and we're studying with various sensors. I, I've lost track, uh, I keep hearing a bigger number. I think we continue to put more and more sensors on this MET tower, um, measuring wind speeds, temperature, um, wind direction, pressure at various elevations along that 140 meter MET tower. I guess the, the highest uh, sensor is at 134 meters. So this is also helping us understand um, the stresses inside the inside the turbine um, and, um, and helping us uh, develop um, uh, better products, better connections, uh, bearings um, uh, at the, uh, you know, at, at 80, 90, and 100 meter uh, hub height. Next slide, please. Oh, so this is, um, we're sliding into a, a, a real poll question, although the food poll question I think was real enough for me. Um, as we talk about capacity factor, um, there's a gross capacity factor and net capacity factor. And we'll talk a little bit about this, um, a little bit about this in, in more detail on a further slide, but when you are, are calculating a net capacity factor um, um, from gross, you're actually taking a bunch of losses um, and, and subtracting it from the gross capacity factor. There's about 10 or so losses that are associated with getting down to a real number to have to calculate energy. Be curious what people think are the, the number one loss. We picked four of the 10. So blade icing, I'm glad to see people are starting to vote right now. Uh, we got blade icing losses, probably won't have the, that in uh, Bangladesh. We got dirty blades, you got wake loss from upstream turbines and transmission losses. So go ahead and vote now. I see the, the bottom two are, the, uh, are competing for being the number one. We got dirty blades getting a few votes as well. We'll let some more Seconds go by as people get a chance to, to vote and guess what they think is the number one loss that brings the gross capacity factor percentage down to a net capacity factor. And if you remember that when you think net capacity factor, if those people aren't, uh, if, if there are some people that are not familiar with it, what, what's important is about this 
this uh, calculation is it really helps you understand what the um, forecast of energy, energy is going to be for a, a wind plant. You, you take your net capacity factor, multiply it times the number of megawatts at your plant, number time, uh, multiply that times the number of hours in the year, 8,760, and you get the total uh, um, number of megawatt hours projected um, by the wind side. So net capacity factor is one of the first numbers you try to get to when you're understanding how, um, how uh, um, profitable your particular site might be. I think we've got enough votes in now. And uh, this looks to be a pretty smart group here. 44% um, vote for weight losses from upstream turbines. And that is the answer. That is the correct answer. And transmission losses, I think that also ranks as number two when you look at that, that list of, of uh, losses. So wake losses, um, for those that are new to the to wind industry, that is by far the number one loss when um, calculating that capacity factor. Thanks. Move to the next, uh, next polling question. And these two will kind of set up the next few slides that I'm going to talk about. So when you think of capacity factor, um, two answers here. Do you think capacity factor is determined by the laws of nature or is it design engineered? Just getting a better handle. Uh, let's help people get a better handle and understanding on what capacity factor is and isn't. So go ahead and vote now. Is it determined by the laws of nature or is it design engineered? Let me give a few more seconds here. We must have a bunch of engineers in the group because they, anything that has the word, any answer that has the word engineer in it, they're probably biased to, to pick it, right? <laughs> I think we're going we're gonna to move on and, and, just, and, uh, and give you the answer. Um, I think again, smart group, the answer is design engineer. I think people, um, are surprised at that uh, in some groups, some stakeholders. Um, it's Im important to understand that that, that the, the um, site layout itself, the specific engineer, um, excuse me, the specific model of turbine that is selected, that is design engineered to have a certain capacity factor at a certain price point um, and is, is uh, designed to be um, um, uh, built or, or sited, I should say, at a site that has a specific wind resource. And I think that some people think that one turbine can be placed anywhere in the world at any wind resource, and that's just not the case. They're designed for, there are some certain turbines that are designed for strong wind resources, medium wind resources, and, and um, low wind resources, class one, two, and three. And um, you want to make sure you, you match up your site with, um, with that turbine. So it's, it's a design engineer um, answer. So if we can move on to the, the next slide. Thank you. And this is a good segue into a computer model that um, I really like, even though the, the actual turbines are hard to see uh, from some people. But if you look, Looking here, this is a wind farm. And you, if you look across the middle of the screen, you see small little wind turbines um, turning. If you look further back, you'll see um, the second row and, and the third. And what this is uh, simulating is wake. So this is related to that first polling question we talked about. The, the red, um, um, the red is imitating or simulating uh, fast moving wind. And the blue, especially the dark blue, is rep representing slow and disturbed wind. And the graph in the middle, it's kind of a representation, a representation of power. So when the, when the wake actually hits that second row of, of turbines, it slows down and reduces the amount of power being generated by the entire uh, wind farm. That's the key takeaway here. Uh, when the wind changes direction, um, and the wake uh, misses that second row and, and third row, then the, 
the uh, energy um, increases, energy output increases for the wind farm. And we're looking at, um, by understanding this, this better, we're looking at control systems that actually can steer that weight, taking that, that upstream turbine and, and yawing it when, it when the actual turbine uh, turns on the top of the tower, that's called yaw. And if you turn it, you can actually, in effect, steer that wake just slightly off, by maybe 5% or 10%, and steer it past that second row and third row and, and increase the overall energy production of the, of the plant itself. And um, that's some new research that's going on right now to increase energy production of, of wind farms. I think it's pretty exciting. Um, next slide, please. This is a, a, another picture that, that um, is looking at a real wind farm. The other was, was a total simulation. This is an actual wind farm in Sweden and uh, offshore, which is interesting because you have a, a lot of uh, uh, constant wind coming from a particular direction. This, this actually kind of shows uh, what not to do because the turbines are really placed too tightly together and um, this is just kind of a static picture of, of wake. Again, red representing fast moving uh, undisturbed wind and blue um, representing disturbed and, and, and you know, it's, the, it's the wake. It's the wake behind the turbine. Each of the black spots represents a, a turbine. And you can see if when the wind direction um, changes, this actually is kind of showing the, the best scenario where the wind is coming at a straight line coming from the from the left, I don't know what direction that necessarily is, we'll just call it left, moving to the right. Um, and, and the wake is actually going between the turbines. But imagine if that wind were coming from the, the uh, top left and running down the line of, of turbines, uh, probably gets to the fourth or fifth turbine and that turbine maybe isn't even running at all. It's maybe even, it, it actually, that wake completely stops some of those back, um, those turbines that are on the, on the downstream uh, end of, of the layout. And of course, that's what we're trying to prevent. So we're trying to stretch turbines out. We're trying to simulate what that might look like with uh, um, uh, a computer model. And that helps with a, a more improved and optimized uh, layout. Um, we've also learned from some of this research that that way, um, travels 15 kilometers sometimes back beyond the, the upstream turbine. So the effect uh, lasts a lot longer than, than we originally thought. You can never really, and you're certainly not gonna separate turbines by 15 kilometers. So you can't eliminate wake, but the goal is to reduce it. Um, so the takeaway is when signing a project and developing the layout, try to mitigate it, um, run, computer simulations based on the, uh, the wind um, uh, analysis, the wind testing and measurement that you've done at your individual site. That helps in understanding um, how to optimize your site. Next, next slide, please. So this is some exciting research that um, uh, we're pioneering here in, in, uh, in Colorado. And, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with LIDAR. For those of you that might be familiar with our, um, with the Bangladesh USAID-funded project, the, the Bangladesh um, um, uh, Energy Assessment, Wind Energy Assessment uh, Project, we used a SODAR pointed up um, for two of the nine sites that, that we uh, uh, measured wind, um, wind characteristics at. And the SODAR looks... Uh, up at, oh, probably goes up to 200 meters, I think, of, of, of uh, uh, data that you can, oh, we got our slide back. Um, and it's, it's measuring wind speed, direction, temperature, uh, pressure. You can also use a LIDAR, a laser, to do that same thing in a, in a very similar application to help understand uh, your, your site. Here's another application. This is a new type of application where you point the laser out and it's looking at the back of the, of the turbine. We, all, we also call that the nacelle. And um, before I 
explain the benefit, I think it's important to understand what's going on now for 99% uh, percent of the turbines out there. Uh, usually, where, where that LIDAR is identified in this, in this graphic, uh, you just have a simple anemometer measuring the wind uh, behind the blades. And, and that, that turbine you know, turns on the top of that, that tower. Again, that's called yaw. And it's not turning um, uh, at every change in direction because there's a lot of gusts that will come from a different direction, so it doesn't change. So there's a control mechanism out there, an, an algorithm tied to that uh, yaw system. And it might wait for, depending on what you set your control at, it might wait for 10 minutes uh, to see that that gust isn't really a gust anymore. It's a, it's a sustained change in direction of the wind. And then the turbine will yaw towards that, um, towards that new direction because the most energy production occurs when the face of the, of the turbine is perpendicular to the direction of, wind, of the wind. So, but you're waiting for these changes to be sustained. And that might be 10, 15 minutes because you're, you're only making that change in real time at the, um, at the turbine itself. What happens with this LIDAR, this is the new application, is it looks out maybe a mile and it can determine whether that is a gust or it can forecast whether the wind is, um, the wind direction changes a gust or a sustained change and turn um, at a more optimum amount of time. So you're, you're kind of getting rid of that 10 and 15 minutes of, of wasted um, inefficient um, um, uh, pointing of the turbine towards the, the wind. So that's, that's also taking three, four, five percent um, and, and moving that onto the positive side of your energy production ledger. Next slide, please. So this is, this is, um, a slide that's kind of pointing at that second poll question. It's, it's helping kind of drive that home. These are power curves, and it's looking at a, a class one, class two, class three turbine. And what it's doing here is showing you that there are different design engineered turbines for specific wind classes. Um, so many mistakes, this is the lesson learned that I, I preach on a lot, so many mistakes in, in uh, countries that are just starting their wind, industry, uh, wind energy industry is they look at the first cost of the turbine and they see a, a good deal um, on, the, on the front end cost of the turbine, but it might not be designed for your wind class at your project site. And so they, they mismatch the turbine with the project site and then wonder why uh, the turbine doesn't spin enough in, in, um, in that wind regime, and they're not making enough energy over the, the life of the project. And it's because they have the turbine sighted to begin with. So just understand there are different power curves uh, for different turbines, and you really have to match that up with, with your specific site, because each one's designed differently. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we've, we've um, walked through wind technology improvements, uh, we've looked at blade design, gearbox and drivetrain improvement, improved O&M, uh, improved controls, low wind speed turbines, how that is really um, one of the most exciting things nowadays, I think is opening up new lands around the world that were not competitive uh, for wind energy um, 10 years ago that are, are absolutely competitive today. And now let's look at some of the numbers. I've got a series of slides here that I think tell the story and help put actual numbers to um, some of these research um, trends, these technology improvement trends that we've talked about in the previous slides. Um, this is looking at a 20-year time frame from 1998 to 2018. That's where this data came from. And um, it's looking at, at, at tower sizes, blade size, 
and capacity um, uh, changes itself. So uh, the quick numbers, if you're having a hard time reading this, this slide, we've got hub height increases from 55 meters. Again, that's the, the height of the tower from 55 meters to 90 meters over the last 20 years from 1998 to 2018. I've actually seen a number of, of towers in the last two years, 2019 and 20, that um, seem, well, those project sites seem to all be using 100 meter towers or, or taller. So um, I think that that average is gonna climb past 90 meters or has already climbed past 90 meters. Rotor diameters have also increased. They were uh, 50 meters when I first started working in wind, and now they're 20 meters. That's the the diameter of, of the rotor itself, the, the swept area of the blades. And we're seeing offshore turbines that are looking at 180 meter rotor diameters and, and bigger. Uh, I think there are designs out there for 200. And of course, there's a corresponding change in capacity. Uh, the, the actual size of the turbine, uh, 660 kW, you know, so a little bit more than a megawatt, um, used to be the size back in the late 90s. That was the average size being deployed. And, and today we're looking at a two and a half megawatt machine as the average. So that's about a four times, uh, you know, a four um, times multiplier. And um, it's just amazing how, how technology has, has improved. Next slide. So Mark, a quick question as you're uh, addressing these next few slides. There's a question about whether this applies to both onshore or offshore or both these price trends and oh. net capacity factor trends. And there are other questions that I'll wait to the end, but when it's applicable to a specific side slide, I'm just yep. gonna bring them up. I'm glad you interrupted me, that's perfect, yes. So all this is, is uh, all these numbers right now in these slides um, are focusing on uh, onshore. So the research um, that I talked about at the beginning certainly applies to both onshore and offshore. How to improve gearboxes of those, you know, that, that research um, um, applies to an onshore uh, turbine, an offshore turbine. But these specific slides here that look at, um, uh, are looking at charts and numbers are all focused on onshore right now because we have a lot of data. And I think these data um, this data provides good trends to understand how the, um, the uh, technology is changing, how that's affecting performance, because you have a lot of uh, projects deployed, a lot of contracts signed. Thanks for that question. So uh, now that we've looked at the, at the size of the turbine, um, let's look at the performance. So we've talked about gross capacity and, and net capacity uh, factor. And again, we always want to get to a net capacity factor number. If you see any article or anyone's talking about capacity factor, make sure that they've uh, explicitly identified if they're talking gross or, or, or net. Because I frequently find that some people, you know, some of the, some research out there or, or some of the articles that are written don't clarify that. And they might be talking capacity. Uh, excuse me, gross capacity factor and not net. And that's, um, uh, I always like to talk net. Um, so you see here, the takeaway is that uh, the NCF, the net capacity factor was in, in the low 20s, um, uh, just 20 years ago. And now it's doubled almost to uh, 40%. As, a, as an average number, and that's, that's average. Uh, a lot of the projects, if not all of them, that are being um, deployed and you know, built in the, in the central part of the United States and some part, central part of North America, that's where the, I call it the wind tunnel of, of this continent. Um, the wind speeds are, are very strong, and almost all of them have a 50% net capacity factor. The last project that I worked on in Nebraska um, had a 50.6 uh, net capacity factor. It was, it was really screaming. Of course, that um, allows you to put your project really low. Moving on to the next slide. So how these uh, tech trends um, and increased performance affect the actual cost of the turbine? Well, I, I love bubble charts. And, and this one might be hard to read, but you see you've got um, 
uh, triangles and, and circles and squares that are, are empty. Um, they're just a border with, and they're not filled in. And then you have the same shape, but they are filled in. And what they're representing are um, order sizes and actual you know, purchasing a certain number of megawatts. So you, there are some economies of scale, of course, associated with that. If you buy more megawatts, you get a, a lower price. Um, uh, small amount of megawatts ordered, it's a, it's a higher price. Um, and then the filled in shapes are specific to Vestas, which is the number one turbine manufacturer in the, in the world, um, and some other indexes that are also identified. So just we're kind of lumping them all together and uh, allow you to, to look at kind of the scale of orders and actual um, um, turbine manufacturers that are are sharing some of their data. And it, there was a, a, you know, in the early first 10 years, I just don't think there's enough data. Plus there was the financial crisis that hit in 2008. That's why I saw a, a rise in, in, in prices. I think the better way to look at this from a price trend perspective is over the last 10 years, where you where the financial crisis had kind of uh, been um, placed in our, in our uh, rear view mirror. And you see a, a clear trend um, sloping down as um, the cost of the turbine itself. Again, we're not talking about installations, just looking at the turbine sales steadily uh, decline. And in the last years, it's fallen down to seven, eight hundred dollars per kW. Next slide, please. So just a quick time check. We're, all, we're just five minutes shy of nine o'clock here. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll hustle up here. So this slide is is looking at the turbine installed. And again, you see a, a price decline. The takeaway from this slide is um, in 2010, we were at $2,500 per kW, and we've moved to $1,400 per kW. And sometimes those costs are, are lower, I think, than some of the numbers I've seen in 2019. Next slide. This is now looking at prices for power uh, to off takers. And same thing, you see a, a price decline that's, uh, that's sharp, um, where we had uh, $60 per kW uh, just a short 10 years ago, and it's fallen down to $20 per kW today. So that's just showing that this, all these technology changes have really um, you know, uh, um, effective price. One more slide, and I'm going to hand it over to Barbara to look at the international view. Um, next slide. This is just a quick one that takes the subsidies out. And so if you, if you look at unsubsidized costs, what, what do those numbers look like? And you can see that they are you know, nationwide um, just under $40 per, per kW in looking at 2018 data. That's unsubsidized um, power. So anyway, um, I'd, I'd like to appreciate your, your time and patience as we've walked through these slides and telling the story of what's going on in North America. Some might ask, well, how do these trends look uh, internationally? And without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Barbara, who will uh, um, give her perspective on, on the international picture. Barbara? Hey, right, thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Thanks for... Um attending this evening. We really appreciate your attention in this virtual world. Not ideal, but we will get back to DACA as soon as we can. Okay, so we're going to um, just go to the next slide, please. Get to these uh, global numbers and, and see where we stand. So the global installed cost of wind um, will reflect countries who are at different um, different points in the path of maturity. So. You know, we've been looking at the U.S. The U.S. is quite the mature wind market. I, um, let's see, I went to work for a utility from the consulting world in 2002. And back then we had a couple of turbines that were, you know, pretty small, 250 kW, 400 kW. 2003, 2004, we started really looking into wind. And by 2004, we were um, installing, you know, 750 kWs, one megawatt, one and a half. And then we went to uh, really full bore on purchasing power from wind through um, independent power producers and um, learned a lot through the process. 
today, 2019, I mean, that's 15 years later, the, what we can get from wind, what we can do with wind is night and day. The good thing for countries who are not as far along is that they can learn lessons from the US and other countries who have higher, higher penetrations of wind in the market. Um, the, the installed cost of wind is gonna go down regardless over time for countries who, who will benefit from these reduced turbine prices that we're seeing. It's not just the reduced turbine prices though, as Mark has been saying, there's other design and engineering considerations which will have downward influence on project pricing. Um, these numbers are from IRENA. This includes, you know, um, installation and pricing. So you can see in the Eurasia category, we've got uh, a weighted average of 1633. Now that represents a lot of countries. India is removed from those numbers, um, but we've got, you know, really strong activity in some countries, including Vietnam, for example, who's going, um, who's, who's really progressing with respect to wind installations. Um, and, you know, some countries that just have stronger wind regimes in Bangladesh. However, again, Bangladesh can benefit from what we're seeing with respect to uh, pricing coming down and all of the, the lessons learned with respect to design and engineering. Next slide, please. So this is similar message to the previous slide. We've got this increased uh, capacity factor. A lot of it has to do with that wind swept area, the size of the, um, the rotor, the diameter of the tip to tip, um, because that has just a disproportionate, you know, a cubed impact on the energy that you get out. And that denominator, the more you increase that denominator, the cheaper that um, currency per megawatt hour goes. So we have, um, you know, Indy, for example, going from 25% capacity factor in 2010 to 32% capacity factor. So you could see across the board, really 30, you know, almost 30% increases in this time period. Um, so again, Bangladesh coming new to the wind, uh, you know, big large scale utility scale wind projects arena can benefit from all of these and hit these numbers. The, the wind speed is lower, but we, again, we optimize based on buying the correct turbine for the wind class and citing it as best we can. And that, you know, for in Bangladesh's case means going toward that, um, the, the shore basically, whether it be onshore, or eventually the prices for offshore will get down low enough that that will be a, a really um, optimal way to pull in wind energy into your country's generation mix. Next slide, please. So, yeah, again, not all of these capacity, uh, not all of the turbine technology, I'm sorry, not all the capacity factor improvements are due to the turbine technology improvements. So these are um, historical onshore weighted average capacity factors. The other things that matter are remote sensing, for example, to figure out where the wind's coming from, to move the yaw motor, to kind of catch that wind, to increase the control performance. The controls, think about it, controls are mostly power electronics. It's cheap, like really inexpensive components. And we've got such great minds. So many universities have programs doing wind um, performance engineering where they can develop these algorithms, these computer programs, and, and we have access to strong computing power and small you know, components where you can install this within the turbine itself to do an algorithm, figure out, okay, with the remote sensing, with the controls, how to really optimize to take advantage of the resource. We also know from wind modeling, from the meteorological modeling and improvements in that arena, where best to site wind projects, like the projects themselves in the country, as, as well as where to site the individual turbines, the micro siting based on um, what we know from those those meteorological models to really get the design dialed in. So a better layout, reduced wake losses, all of these things will help this increase capacity factor. Next slide, please. So this impacts that uh, global levelized cost of energy for wind going down, down, down from 1983 in this case, in this graph, down to 2019. I mean, it just keeps coming down. Um, in, there's an 83% reduction in the time period graphed here. We've gotten 
the LCOE down to $53 per megawatt hour. So that's five US cent power, um, which is amazing, you know, especially considering that it's averaged over all sorts of wind regimes. Um, and of course, over the decade, we're looking at 39% reduction from 2010 to 2019. Th that means that wind is competing with hydro as the lowest cost renewable energy resource with no subsidy. So that's really impressive. Um, it's easier to cite wind in many cases than hydro. A lot of the good hydro sites have been exploited um, and there's lots of other competing uses for water as we know. So we're really encouraged with where wind is going to go. Again, taller towers means larger rotor diameters and better sites. All of those things will contribute to this global levelized cost of energy that is that is on the decline. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Mark to go back to uh, the technology piece and look at some offshore wind um, issues and facts. Thanks, Barb. Um, the next slide, I think we, we've got a poll question coming up here uh, shortly too, but people asked about uh, offshore wind. Uh, we didn't have enough time and didn't think it was appropriate to have um, a large focus on, on offshore, but we know we get enough questions that we had to have a, a slide or two that, that uh, talked about it. Uh, one question I get a lot is, um, is did the um, uh, wind measurement analysis that, that we perform uh, look at offshore? And the answer is yes. <clears throat> of course, we did not have a, a, a buoy out there measuring the wind to validate the model, but the model did look at 20 kilometers offshore and that data is available for um, uh, general use to get a sense of where that, where that wind speed is. One of the, um, um, switching to, to costs, one of the things that I wanted to focus on uh, was give you a sense of how, well, um, how cost uh, differs between onshore and offshore. So we have a poll question to, to uh, kind of set that up. If we could move to that, that would be great. Um, so when you look at offshore versus onshore, for an onshore-based turbine, the, the turbine itself for, for onshore, land-based, represents two-thirds of the entire installed cost of the project. So for offshore, what do you think that percentage is for just the turbine compared to the total installed cost? So we got four options here for you to choose. Go ahead and pick your answers now. Do you think for that offshore turbine, what percentage of the total installed cost is that for an offshore turbine? Is it 25%, 33%, 66 or 75%? Go ahead and answer now. Remember it's in your, that link is in your chat box. I think uh, Danielle just gave you <clears throat> some numbers. Okay, we've gotten some answers in, and for for time, I'm just going to quickly jump to the to the answer. And and yes, uh, this group's probably been reading some articles here. That is the correct answer, B, 33 percent. So it's a kind of mirror image, isn't it? Well, I, I find that to be an interesting data point. So two thirds of the uh, cost of of um, um, a uh, offshore turbine is the installation but only one third of the installation cost for a land-based turbine is, in, is installation. So it's the exact flip. And of course, the reason is there's just so much extra cost in uh, tethering or connecting that turbine to the, to the ocean floor. And of course, the marine cable, the actual interconnection itself is more costly. The logistics um, of getting the components uh, delivered uh, and then out to the site. Sometimes new docks are needed to be prepared uh, to store the turbines as they're being uh, shipped out to the individual sites. Just, it's much more costly. So getting a sense of that cost breakout is, uh, is uh, important when looking at the difference between uh, putting together a spreadsheet, a pro forma for an onshore turbine versus an offshore turbine. Move to the next slide, please. This is a, a slide. These slides will be available to you but it gives you that breakout. So all the green uh, for the land-based uh, turbine is, is uh, you know, it's looking at the tower, the rotor, 
um, the drivetrain. The, um, yeah, I guess those are the three big components. And if you look at the green below for offshore, that total green kind of represents that those three components: the the rotor, the drivetrain, and the and the tower. Only one third of the total cost of installation for an offshore turbine. So that was the the one little uh, interesting. Um, uh, piece of information I wanted to share with you today. And maybe we'll, if there's more interest in this, we could uh, develop a, a module that's just focused on offshore if people are interested. Next slide, please. So just as a quick summary um, of the, uh, of this technology primer, um, there's some key takeaways. Wind energy is, is a mature business now. We've got 40 years of research behind us and uh, it's helped us improve reliability, uh, improved performance. Um, we've got uh, a lot of collaboration with, with industry um, and labs around the world looking at how to improve that reliability and performance specifically uh, at the drivetrain uh, level, uh, blade design, uh, taller towers, more sophisticated controls. Uh, as these uh, towers and blades get, get bigger, I didn't mention this, but that there's on-site manufacturing that's actually being looked at right now because the, the logistics of getting a, some of this really, um, these large components underneath uh, highway overpasses and railroad overpasses. And so they're looking at ways to actually bring that, that, um, that manufacturing to the site itself um, and manufacture a larger component. Um, and of course, all of these improvements are helping to, to drive down costs and, and uh, and pricing. Um, and why are, are, why are countries doing it? Why are utilities doing it around the world? Well, it's because they have this one common goal. And I know it's one of the goals in Bangladesh, and that goal is, is how do we diversify our generation mix? Not one technology can provide all that you need to, um, to meet your demand uh, requirements. And so having wind in that, um, that low-cost wind um, in your generation mix, and utilities are finding that to be a, a really positive uh, um, uh, adder to their, um, their diversification strategy. And with that, I'll hand the mic back to Karishma. And um, I think she's got some questions that she wants to pose to Barbara and I. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mark and Barbara, there's been some great questions coming in. Um, uh, and we saved a bunch for them at the end. So uh, Barbara, if you wanna also hop on and put your video on, we can uh, maybe start. Um, well, so one question uh, was just based on current research and market trends, how do you see the prospect of wind power development and emerging economies and low, regime, uh, low wind regimes? And this is a great question um, for just the region in general, both Mark and Barbara alluded to some of, um, you know, the need to match technology with the wind regime. So Mark, did you want to address that? Uh, emerging economies, low wind regimes, and what do you see as the prospects for wind energy development? Well, I think they're strong. Um, I mean, that was, that certainly is the, one of the main takeaways I, I hope this audience um, received is that these turbines, um, based on all the, the research and the, the uh, uh, numerous deployments now, it's just not at the research level. We've got actual projects out there that are in low wind speed areas across the world uh, demonstrating that it, it works and that it, it can provide energy independence, meet, can meet that goal in the area. It certainly provides rural economic development, which is a a challenge, I think, in many countries. How do we provide jobs out in these rural areas? And, and this is a way to do that. And of course, it provides uh, um, diversification in your, your energy mix. I know that I've talked with uh, some a, a number of rate um, managers at utilities that say that they really like wind in their, in, in their energy mix at a certain level because it provides price um, uh, certainty. They know exactly what that price of, of power is going to be in year one, year eight, year 18. Um, and they don't know that with um, um, gas and, and coal because of the um, fluctuations with, with that technology. 
So that's one of the, the benefits. So I think there's uh, with emerging economies who are trying to get their um, trying to meet some economic uh, goals and some energy diversification goals. I think that's a it's um, it's a very it's a very positive uh, way to go. Okay, thanks, Mark. Barbara, did you want to add anything? We have a few more questions coming up. I'll just be quick. I mean, yeah, it's basically that the cost of wind has come down. And there are other benefits that countries are seeing with respect to meeting their um, Paris Agreement commitments, as an example, or need for diversification or need for um, security of supply if they don't have indigenous fossil fuels. Um, they are seeing the risk at being beholden to other countries with respect to importing those fuels. And so, uh, you know, with, with the wind prices coming down, and a lot of that's based on technology, and the other concerns coming up, environmental and um, security of supply, that sort of thing, uh, fuel price volatility, et cetera, um, it's coming into the mix. And we believe that diversification of generation assets is really what will provide a system that is um, resilient and can, you know, can have that flexibility of, of supply to really match the needs of the system. Thanks, Barb. Since you have the floor, let me um, send the next question to you. Um, early on in the presentation, Mark was talking about the wind side and just, you know, pre presenting all this, uh, the system. And so one of the early questions was without batteries, can, can this system provide reliable power? So I, just broadening it, um, how do batteries and renewable energy pair? And can, can you have standalone renewable energy without uh, batteries? And is that reliable? Well, I mean, the answer is no, you can't, you can't, you know, take that check to the bank that the wind is going to be blowing all the time. So you can't have wind as a sole reliable source of power without some way of storing the energy. Batteries is one way of storing the energy. There's other um, things that are coming up. You know, there's technologies like flywheels or like you know, obviously pumping water, pumping other large objects with mass or um, utilizing um, storage within, um, you know, fuel cells or hydrogen. But in general, what we see, there's no system that is solely solely based on wind, right? Even on very windy islands, you have your wind uh, with your solar and maybe even batteries, but even so sometimes it makes sense to have a small diesel unit to ensure reliability. So it's a question of combining wind with other sources. Um, the thing that is happening for higher penetrations of variable renewable energies, i.e. solar and wind regimes, is that the concern about the loss of inertia when you increase the penetration of non-synchronous machines relative to the synchronized machines that provide for that frequency regulation through its, their own inertial element, with through their own you know, actual um, rotor of, the, of the, the generator itself, that is what wind is providing now. So we can use active power control on wind turbines to provide that grid service. So for regimes that have a lot of wind, and need to worry about not just a, a secondary or even a primary frequency response, but something more immediate, this immediate inertial response. Hey, if you guys could just mute your phones, that'd be great, thanks. Um, if, you, if you need that inertial response, you can borrow the kinetic energy from that wind turbine rotor to have an immediate arrest of the decline of the uh, frequency. So it's the Rokoff, the rate of change of frequency. You can make that Rokoff lesser by just borrowing from the rotor and then you pay it back on the backswing when you can pull in your other uh, frequency responsive resources. Thanks, Barb. Uh, Mark, I'll throw this next question to you. Um, combining a couple of questions here, but basically it's to do with transportation um, and just, you know, what are some of the um, um, mechanisms to install turbines and how to reach, say, coastal areas that might have high speed, uh, high, higher wind speeds, um, and just the road access issue. So, wondering if you have a few comments on the transportation uh, piece. Sure. Um, you know, this is where I think government can, can play a, a really big role because if you're looking at areas of the country that you think have the, the strongest wind resource, but lack some of the uh, you know, highway infrastructure or railroad infrastructure, uh, and you think that several projects would, you know, could be developed there, then making sure that there was a, um, uh, a road system that, that, that went to those areas and or railroad um, uh, solves those, those problems. Um, only if there's a, 
a, a port that's nearby, bringing in um, large components and, and into a dock and making sure that they can be craned off and then transported by truck um, to the site. I, I haven't worked on a project that didn't require some kind of transportation um, uh, improvement. Um, you know, when you're working with long um, pieces of, of equipment or heavy pieces of equipment um, on the projects that I've worked on, we always had to go in and, and improve radiuses. We called that uh, road radius uh, improvement. So um, that meant just taking, you know, dirt and, and filling in the, the corner of an intersection so that the trailer can go around and then removing that dirt after. That's just, that's standard operating, um, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard operating task within any project. Um, if, there isn't a, if there's a dirt road there and that needs to be uh, paved um, for, you know, uh, 100 miles, then that might be where government comes in. But, the, but in a project site, um, usually the, the project owner is the one responsible for all the local uh, road uh, repair um, and, uh, and improvement. That's, that's, there's a component in the project performer that, that covers that. So if we're talking about long distance, I'd say I think the government can come in and, and help provide a, an answer there. And at the local level, that usually is a cost that's burdened um, by the actual project itself. You might Thanks. need to shore up the bridges too, right, Mark, and some of the project sites that yep. have. Yeah, if there's bridges, issues. exactly. Yeah, because the turbine is... nacelle itself is, is 120,000 pounds usually with the truck. And so mm -hmm. you have a bridge that can, can handle that. That's, a, that's something that happens here in the U.S. That, that because of the freezing and thawing of a lot of the country roads, there's weight limitations on those roads. And that's part of the... Uh, the logistical plan is to make sure you don't run on that road during that month when there's heaving and the road system is weak. You, you wait till everything's dried out and you bring it in during a specific month. So all that's taken into, into um, uh, consideration, the weight of the equipment and uh, of course the size of the equipment. Thanks, Mark and Barbara. And, you know, just to say that on our next webinar tomorrow, we'll be talking a little bit more about these individual costs and how they roll up into the whole pro wind development process. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions about just um, what the technical resource potential is in Bangladesh. Um, and, you know, I'll refer you to the study we did, the assessment, mm -hmm. and we'll also follow up with some of these resources um, that, that can help answer those questions. Um, and we'll move on to some of these other questions. Um, let's see. Well, so there's environmental effects that we didn't really address. What are some of those impacts? Mark, I'll throw it to you since you have the floor. Um, what are, you know, and you can be brief because there's much, much research out there that we can also share in a follow-up email. Uh, what are some of those environmental impacts uh, on birds and bats and other things? Yeah, and I was going to cover that in a little bit of detail tomorrow too during the development okay. uh, module. If if there are um, a significant okay. number of folks that are are um, tuning into to both modules, but I'll just quickly say that that that's um, typically the responsibility of of the um, project owner um, during the permitting process. It's it's understanding what um, studies need to be completed. And there's a, there's a host of studies. There's a, a you know, threatened and endangered species study that typically you'll see here in the US and other parts of the world. Um, uh, an avian study that just focuses on, on birds is a study that you'll see. A cultural study is one that is usually always required as well. Um, a, uh, um, we call it a comm search study, but basically it's looking at making sure you're not putting the turbines in the path of, of microwave towers and interfering with emergency equipment communication, emergency uh, communication. And um, all those studies need to be completed um, usually to receive your construction permit. And then that in turn is packaged together and you take it to your bank to show that all those appropriate studies have been completed and that you've got your construction permit. Um, and um, um, you work with the county on, on a lot of that county and, and re province um, uh, guidelines that that might be that might have more specific uh, requirements. So it's a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, 
um, um, collaboration with uh, um, state and federal uh, individuals that are, are focused on um, uh, better understanding uh, responsible development and making sure that, that that everyone's on the same page with regards to um, the, the proper studies and the proper protocols within those studies that should be taken. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so there's some questions broadly about grid integration um, and batteries. But before that, let's talk really quickly about uh, just tariff uh, and what, Barbara, I'll throw this one to you. There's a question about, you know, um, research showing that Bangladesh can have capacity factor close to 25% and that the grid tariff is close to 10 cents. So considering that, what do you think is the potential for the deployment of large scale parks in Bangladesh? Um, basically just the tariff and you know uh, the cost of deploying a big wind farm at this moment. And then there's a connected question that's just talking about what is the scope for small and medium scale wind development in Bangladesh? So, I mean, it's just off the top of my head, it sounds like a, a 10 cent tariff and a 25% CF would, would pencil out. It's so just a question of doing the math. Um, I don't know if that includes everything, if, if that's net capacity factor, and uh, we can talk a little bit about the losses and how to get from gross to net. But um, I, I think that sounds rich, right? I think a 10 cent tariff sounds rich enough to handle a 25% capacity factor. So, yes, I would... I would bet that that works out, but I, I'd have to do the math. Um, with respect to um, medium scale and small scale, so the thing about the thing about wind is that you really get a benefit from erecting large projects. When when I was working as a developer, we wouldn't look at anything less than 50 megawatts. I was working in the middle of this country, um, headquartered in Denver, looking at sort of the the surrounding states and down to Texas. So there was a lot of land and we could do these big projects, but our company chose that 50 megawatt cutoff. It was quite arbitrary, but the idea was that um, there's a lot of startup costs with respect to getting your permits, getting your interconnection, you know, buying equipment to make your project substation work. Um, one, of, one of the project pro forma pieces, as an example, is just renting a crane. So renting, I mean, this is, you know, 15 years ago, but back at that time, renting a crane was somewhere on the order of 25 to $50,000 a day, depending on how big the crane was. So once you rent it, you need to make that crane move and, you know, and get that, that whole project erected. Now, if you were to rent, the, uh, rent that for just some small 10 megawatt project, um, you know, it's just going to make that, that cost, the numerator of your dollar per megawatt hour number bigger. So, Anything that's a fixed cost, um, you know, you want to just be able to normalize it against a larger project size. Having said that, on the small, I mean, there's there's been a lot of developments in distributed wind and really small uh, scale turbines that could be appropriate for Bangladesh, especially if you go away from that coast and up into, um, you know, some of the more forested areas, that kind of thing up in the in the north. Um, again, it depends. It's very dependent on the project site itself. And I'm going to ask Mark to add to that. Yeah, I I would um, I certainly agree with everything you said. Another little cost number that you might find interesting. And this this is a little bit dated, but uh, uh, six years ago, um, when we were constructing a, a wind project, uh, we always assumed sixty thousand dollars to demob and mob the crane. So it was important to make sure that you had enough connecting land and hopefully not a transmission line that you had to go underneath because if there was a transmission line or a river or anything that required, that prevented you from, from just driving the crane down each row uh, and if it required you to, to take it apart and put it back on a truck and move it over the river or move it under the power line and then put it back up again, that was sixty thousand dollars, and if, with large projects, you usually did need, need to do that at least once, and sometimes it was a, a few times. So you're always trying to, again, it was a logistics engineering, trying to see how you can move that crane um, across your project without having to demob and, and mob the um, the uh, turbine because that was an extra sixty thousand dollars. That was expensive, and and the large cranes as the towers get taller, uh, there are a few of them in the country. To, to rent. 
So it's not only the price of the, the, the uh, crane, it's the availability. So, I mean, in general, just kind of wrapping that, you know, the, the, the larger the project, the better. That just makes sense based on economics. But then also the higher the turbine height, the better. Because of the wind shear uh, characteristic of wind, the higher you go, the higher the wind speed, and that's going to get you more, more, more megawatt hours out of that turbine. So regardless of whether you, you go with a single turbine project or a 100 turbine project, the higher the hub height, the more, uh, I mean, it's more expensive to, to buy that turbine and to erect it, but it's going to get you better output. Yeah. I might, um, one other thing I guess I'll I add, because I just remembered the first part of the question. I was just tagging on the, the back end of your answer, Barbara, but the, the, uh, the questioner was asking about um, price. And this is also a, a dated number that's, that's uh, probably 10 years ago, but um, it, it does, I do think that, that, uh, um, a mid 20s uh, NCF and a, and a hundred dollar megawatt hour um, tariff. I think that does pencil out. I agree with Barbara's comment. That one one project that I remember with older technology it was a 30 megawatt project, so they didn't have the economies of scale. It was a smaller turbine. Um, it was uh, I think a, a one point. Um, I think it was a 1.5 megawatt machine, but it was on a 55 meter tower, so it wasn't uh, high up. It was one of GE's first first um, generation, and that um, uh, PPA price was $84, as I recall. I was in the Midwest, so 8.4 cents a kilowatt hour. And it was a 30 megawatt project, and they had uh, 22 to 25 percent, as I recall, um, NCF at that site, and that worked for them. So that, that was, again, that's dated, that's a dated number. Um, <clears throat> but I think uh, with the improvement in technology and the reduction in price, I, I think that that still, still hunts. And so, I'll just add, but we're right at, uh, at the hour here, we're at 9.30 and I'll just say that, you know, there's a comment about renewable energy devel development and economic zones. And you know, there's, there's sort of this integrated approach that can also help uh, with economies of scale um, and you know, provide some of those benefits, especially as Bangladesh is beginning to um, consider some of those approaches um, for, for more reliable uh, energy. Yeah, I mean, that's really important to consider when we talk about building out infrastructure and the cost of doing that. If you can decide where the best wind zones are and where a number of projects are going to go and the government can help facilitate building out the transmission line or building out a road system or building out a port facility to get a barge in, that's going to make sense to really evaluate as a whole the, the best economics for um, pulling out a number of projects in a certain area. And one other thing, Karishma, I know I'm sliding under the wire, but with respect to the feed forward control and the LIDAR, what you do is you look at the wind coming for gusts and then you modify the pitch of the blades. I'm showing my pitch here, you can't see. But this whole pitch thing, right? Because there's so much pressure on those blades that that's how equipment can get hurt. Even when you have cyclone strength winds, you wanna feather the blades, you straighten them out so that the wind flies over them. If you know that the wind gust is coming, the cyclone is coming, then you can feather the blades in order to withstand these really high, high pressures on your equipment. And, oh, and that, putting a, a generator on the turbine itself is also being studied so that you still have yaw control. So frequently they find that, that electricity is cut from the um, uh, wind plant itself and, and then you're not allowed to, to do the pitch because there's no power to the turbine. So adding in hurricane zone areas, adding a small little generator that uh, has enough power for yaw control and pitch, yaw and pitch control um, is a solution for those areas in, in hurricane territory. Okay, great. I think we were able to touch on most of those questions. Uh, we're just uh, out of time here. Uh, but I want to remind everyone that our contact information should be on your screen. So please feel free to reach out. Um, it has the NRL team, but also Cheyenne at USAID's uh, contact information. So if you have USAID programming specific questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, once again, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and attendees for joining. Uh, we, of course, appreciate your time and hope you can, um, you know, take some of these valuable insights back to your organizations.
Uh, our next webinar in the series is on the wind development process, and that is tomorrow, August 12th at 8 p.m. Dhaka time. Um, you can join using that same link, uh, and, you, and, and I hope you'll join us. Uh, clearly, there's much more discussions to be had, um, and we will continue our conversations then. So thank you, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>